is, I know it's been building for a month for a lot of the children to use, today is Purple Day. So, um, if you need a waiver, we still got some? Anybody need one? No? This is your last chance to intentionally ditch the sermon. <laughs> Feel free! No? No takers? All right. All right. Thank you to everyone who participated in yesterday's community breakfast. Um, I missed it, so I apologize for that. I assume it was a... And a few other people. It was a beautiful fall day, right as we're enjoying fall's fall. Before we go to overheated summer for like a four-day period. And then we go into everything falls off the tree and gets muddy all at once, right? That's how the fall works here in Ohio. At least that's been my experience. In uh, Indiana, it was about the same. So, anyway, so I am driving my driving me today, I saw that it's like the pumpkin farms and stuff are opening up beginning next week. And so, that's always an exciting time to go get lost in a corn maze or, you know, whatever. Whatever suits your fancy for those times of the year. Um, let's see. We will be having our annual chicken noodle dinner. Um, dough preparation will be on October 7th. Noodle preparation will be on October 8th. Both times, if you can uh, participate, will be on 9 a.m., right? Friday will be different. So the Thursday time, the October 8th time, will be 9 a.m. This will make it into the announcements in the email and will be in part of these announcements in the weeks going forward. So if I messed it up today or it changes, or you didn't have a chance to write it down, you've got an opportunity to fix it. Sound good? All right. I'm going to lose a little bit of translation. Chicken broth, chickens, cook them, get rid of all the stuff that doesn't, we don't put in the noodles, right? So if, you don't like, if you don't like bones in your chicken noodle soup, right? Get them out before you bring them in. And then uh, pies and things that we can be baking along the way. So, and if you have any questions, right? All right. We got a few people. Uh, let's see. I wanted to point out, on the table just outside the door, we had our ad council meeting last Monday. Most of it was um, uh, a review of your pastor, a performance review, and then also of our ministry going forward. And so the summary of that is out on that table. I think the first four pages are um, kind of the goals for the church and the, over the next four months and as we look longer term. Um, it is mostly about how we connect with the community and how we make best use of our facilities. And then also a review of your pastor, which um, the, we've been in kind of a discernment process for a few months about how we wanted to make some adjustments pastorally going forward. And the proposal and everything in the end of the system is a proposal, right? You can communicate to the superintendent your desire as a pastor, your desire as a congregation. That gets taken into consideration by the bishop who makes a decision in discussion with the cabinet which the district superintendent is a part, and then they tell you what God says. Right? Okay? But the, 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 the proposal is that I stay here as your pastor, right, that I continue to be on reduced hours. We're going to reduce my salary a bit to hopefully make room for a children and youth ministry position. Okay? And so we'll have hopefully another staff person with that area of focus. And so, without really changing the budget, we're going to try to focus the ministry. Does that make sense? So that's the gist of it. If you want the official summary, it's on the table. If you have questions, um, anybody in our ad council will certainly can talk to me as well. Let's see. Trunk or treat? We have a tentative date of October 23rd. So we're going to um, plan to do... Um, you know, worship, and then we're probably looking at trying to do a kitchen and a bonfire as well as a trunk or tree, trying to make it more of an a, a afternoon event and, and hang out type of thing as opposed to just a come and go. You with me? So, lots of details. That's the, that's the total vagueness that we have right now. That's where we're going. And then the last one that I know I would be reprimanded severely 
if I didn't bring up. Can you hear me, Anna? All right. Somebody turned eight years old this week. If you'd like to sing to her, she would like to be sung to. Ready?
Knowing that the kids were going to vacate, I figured that one needed to come earlier. So please join me in a posture. Loving God, we are grateful that we can come together today, that we can celebrate you and celebrate our struggles, celebrate our frustrations, celebrate the difficulties of life. That seems like such a strange set of words to put together, but our hope and our life and our love is in you, and we cling to that in a way that allows us to persevere through the journeys and the trials of life. We pray for those who are suffering abroad in places of war and famine, places of flooding and natural disaster. We pray for our nation. We pray for unity and strength, for hope and common purpose. We pray for our neighbors. We pray for their, their needs, what is on their heart. Lord, we are often disconnected from the suffering and the happenings of life from those around us. We pray, pray that we can be centered in you, that we can listen, and that we can hear your voice to speak your hope your grace and your love into a hurting world. And as a reminder of that hope, we now say together the words that your Son Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. One of the great blessings of the United Methodist Hymnal is the introduction of, to many of us, of Charles Albert Tinley, and the both words and the music were done by Tin Tinley in this case, one of the great African American composers and hymn writers that we wouldn't, I wouldn't know about if it weren't for this hymn. Rachel.
part of me likes because you get the main themes of the, of the letter, and part of me wishes we could do a little bit deeper dive. And so it's interesting, when I was here uh, yesterday preparing for this, I went through four commentaries, which are um, tools where people have gone through like line by line, verse by verse, and they registered their thoughts on what they think the letter means and who it's for and what it means for us. And it was interesting, I looked at four of them, and all four of them came from radically different perspectives. I mentioned last week a little bit about issues around this book, around authorship, and, and, and setting and its intended audience, and each of these four came from a radically different position, point of view, and so I kind of tried to figure out what to do with that, and I put it together in my notes, and if you're interested in that sermon, those notes were in the trash can out by the coffee. <laughs> So we're going in a completely different direction, and because I want, what I want to do is kind of stay on this cursory, higher level, and kind of walk through. In, in, this, in this section that I have here marked, if I can find it, um, Colossians 1, verse 24, this, this, the verse reads like this, Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's affliction for the stake of his body, which is the church. And we could do an entire sermon right there, because it's enough confusing wording of what that's talking about. But what I wanted to specifically to build on here is that, so last week, we know that Paul sent this letter to the Colossian church, which he had never met, right? It was a friend of his, a servant of his, that founded that church. So he has never been there. He has never interacted with them. But he's heard of them, and so he's been praying for them and rejoicing in them. And then he switches tone here and says, and then I rejoice in basically the suffering that he has received. Now, this is one of, in my opinion, one of the most misunderstood, misused, or abused lines that we have in Scripture. We have to understand what suffering is. First of all, one of the things we need to avoid is what I referred to last week as romanticizing Paul's imprisonment. Right? This is not house arrest with the butler bringing you tea and crumpets while you write these letters off to these churches. Right? Romans didn't do that. Right? The reason they liked the cross is because it tortured the person on it. And they, especially if they arrested a large group of people, they would line the streets for miles as a warning sign to others of what they are willing to do to people who revolt against the Roman government. And so for miles, you could have crosses of people. And they weren't big on taking the bodies off the cross. Right? Let them rot there. And the next time anyone thinks of contradicting the government in any shape, way, or form would have some second thoughts. So, with that as a context, what do you think their prisons were like? Right? You need to think dungeon, and like even the, the guards didn't want to be there. Right? And so we need, when Paul says he's suffering in prison, he's suffering. I mean, part of the, the point of putting someone in prison was you could starve them to death, a nice painful way to die, or they could catch something and they would be killed by disease. The, those were the two most common outcomes in a Roman prison. It wasn't actually trial or execution. Those were sort of like, if you made it that far. So I give a little bit of a context of where he's writing from. The other piece is, there's a propensity to kind of romanticize. After 2,000 years, Paul is this enormous figure in Western culture in Christian culture, right? Next to Jesus, there's Paul, right? We know 1A, we know number 2, 
right? We'll maybe go to maybe to Peter, and then we'll go to some other folks, right? So Paul is this exalted figure. That's not what he was to the Roman Empire. Yes, he called on his Roman citizenship and his own trial and that type of thing. That afforded him some benefits, but it, he's still a, a small, nameless leader in a small, nameless community that has, for at least a couple of centuries, been a pain in the neck to the Roman government. Okay? So there's no... There's no... There's nothing good that comes from this, right? And yet, Paul writes these words, I rejoice in my suffering for you. And now I want to jump into a more personal, contemporary example to try to explain what Paul is talking about. Because there's a difference in rejoicing in suffering and rejoicing in what happens after the suffering. Hang with me, because I know I'm about to lose most of you. Right? Under no circumstances would my wife and I consider her multiple sclerosis a gift. It brings about daily suffering. It brings out daily challenges. And I appreciate all the jealousy over the handicapped parking sticker, <laughs> but you can have the better parking spot in exchange for her ability to walk freely. You with me? Okay? We do not rejoice in her MS. However, we have met and been able to minister with dozens upon dozens of people that we would never have connected with except for MS. She has, over the course of her 20, 25 years with this disease, been part of teams that raised tens of thousands of dollars that went to the Multiple Sclerosis Society, that has further research, that has helped people that we can't even imagine how we can touch. We do not rejoice in her MS. We rejoice in what has flown, come out of that. Right? The lives that we've been able to interact with, the lives that we've been a part of changing. I can rejoice in that each and every moment of my life. And it doesn't remove the day-to-day -day struggle. Do you, do you understand the difference? That's what Paul is talking about. Does he want to be beaten, stoned, and in prison? No. Is he elated with the faithfulness of this Colossian church? Yes. And if in order for them to have that type of faith, he had to endure this, as much as he hates it, he would do it. Right? I wouldn't take away MS. I also wouldn't wish it upon anybody. But for anybody who's going through it, let's walk together. Right? That's where Paul's coming from. Whenever he speaks of suffering, it's that impulse. It's not rejoicing in suffering for suffering's sake. You with me? This is a, God doesn't design us to suffer. Life causes us to suffer. You with me? So that's the tension. So now that you know Paul is suffering and he knows that because these folks are alive, they're suffering in some shape, way, or form too. So that's when you get the first part of what David read in the scripture today, right? Live the life according to Jesus. I read one of those commentaries was John Wesley. He talks about when it says living, living your life for Jesus, it's talking about using Jesus as your example of how to live what faith looks like, what love looks like, what forgiveness looks like, what compassion looks like, what mercy looks like. Emulate that just as you were taught. Because that's what you responded to in the first place. Right? It's that joy. It's that purpose. 
It's that meaning in life. Hold on to that and don't let go. Because, and this is the second part of the scripture that was read this morning, the world's going to try to take it away. Right? Because the world doesn't necessarily understand spiritual things. It certainly, in the early decades, didn't understand Jesus. You can argue we still don't understand Jesus, right? And so there are things in this world that are going to steal that joy, that are going to take that from you, or are going to try. And what Paul is doing is don't let go. Now he'll go on to talk about being so rules-based that you forget that you had joy and you're just trying to follow the rules. And, you know, the latest self-help, self-help is not just the last 15, 20 years. Right? Self-help's been around for a long time. The other part is how do you just navigate life? Right? Put your head down, do your thing, and don't butt heads with anybody. That's the greatest way to keep you off the cross. Right? That's the message from the Roman government. Right? So we rejoice that suffering has led to this new life that we have grasped the whole world. And then as life comes by, whatever you do, do not let go. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Loving God, we are grateful for the scripture, for your word, for your teaching, for your model. Lord, we pray that our suffering has some sort of purpose, that there's something that despite of it, we can turn it into something that provides meaning. Lord, let us maintain our joy and our love for you. Let us hold fast to who you are and grow in our love of you. As John Wesley would say, a perfect love of God and a perfect love of neighbor. Lord, let this be our prayer. And in the storms of life, in the tragedy and the loss of life, may we cling to that hope. May we cling to your promise. And we may be claimed to who you are. And all God's people said, Amen. <coughs> so at this time, I will see you. Oh, we've got people working on the offering. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Go ahead. I'll have you draw as we stand back up.
time you can either hang out and let virgin take them, <laughs> or you are free to go rescue them, whichever you prefer. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.